Welcome, Jan Betons, from blasting in from Europe. Um, you're going to be talking about Franco-Belge bande dessinée. Welcome, Jan. Thank you. Welcome for having me in this, uh, I cannot say show, but I, it's, it feels like a show. Yes. Well, thank you. Yes, it is. It's like the Professor Latinx show. And, you know, in this time when we're all kind of locked down, I feel like it's a, another way for us to connect, even if it's not in person. It's, um, we can share some of the things that we're thinking about in our, our journeys with our students and other um, listeners and viewers. Um, why, uh, Jan, research and write on comics? And you are one of the pillars of this sort of research, this research program, um, also including, you know, pop culture, the roman photo, you do so much, but tell us, like, share a little bit, like, was it you were a child, the origin story of Jan, and this sort of comics came into your life? Tell us how you got yes, on. Yes, yes. Yeah. Definitely, I learned to, to, let's say, to read and to write with, thanks to comics, but it's important to, let's say, for an, an American audience, it's important to know that, um, or to be aware of the fact that in my home country, in Belgium, comics are not at all considered, let's say, an, um, a lowbrow, uh, popular cultural medium. It is perfectly part of mainstream culture. It is all over the place, and it is perfectly allowed to read it, not just as a child, as a kid, but also as an adult. Uh, when you read comics, for instance, in, in, the, in the train or whatever, or even in class, um, it is considered perfectly legitimate. And uh, it is even strongly encouraged. My, my parents were high school teachers have from the very beginning, let's say from age five, six on, have strongly encouraged me to, uh, to read comics. It was certainly not considered as something that would, let's say, prevent me from um, accessing serious uh, or legitimate uh, culture uh, at all. Comics are also have their place, uh, have their legitimate place in, um, in the educational system in Belgium. Comics are, for instance, used for the um, foreign language training. Mm. And in uh, Belgium, we are supposed that um, high school level, so the, the children between, or let's see, adolescents between 12 and 18 years are supposed to learn um, at least two, but preferably three foreign language languages at different levels. And comics are actively used to, uh, to teach um, French, English, German, Spanish, uh, and so on and so forth. But that's, let's say, my first uh, contacts with, with comics. I've been reading comics, let's say, thousands and thousands of comics during my youth. And I've always continued to do so. Um, but there's also the fact, from the other uh, completely different point of view, that I'm teaching in an, a cultural studies department, where, of course, the distinction between high and low, text and image, uh, mainstream, uh, non-canonical, should not exist and actually doesn't, does not exist at all. And that, of course, is a, another encouragement to not just to, to study, um, to, um, uh, to investigate, but also to teach comics. Of course, I try to do it uh, in my way. And um, of course, it's difficult to summarize it in just uh, a couple of words, but I think that what distinguishes my special take or my own take on comics is, let's say, a kind of combination of, on the one hand, I'm, I'm as you know it, I have an, a very formalist background, and I think that um, that kind of close reading, extremely meticulous, almost drilling of, of um, comics is very important because it also demonstrates that comics can be read as carefully, as closely as 
for instance, a poem by T.S. Eliot. I don't make any difference at that level between a poem by T.S. Eliot and a good comics page. So I think that is one of my, uh, let's say, one of the elements that distinguish my, my special way of, of um, doing comics, but as also the fact that um, I've become more and more interested in, um, let's say, the, the issue of what you call in English the publication format, mm -hmm. which means that I try to stress as much as possible the place of comics or the possible links between um, comics and the discipline that is called book history. And that as well is an attempt, uh, at least from my point of view, to upgrade the study of comics. And uh, I'm, sh I'm personally convinced that through the study of comics, it is uh, possible to initiate students to the, um, um, to book history, which may seem extremely boring from uh, <laughs> many points of view, many points of view. And I share, let's say, the, the reluctance to, um, to get started with book history as such. But through comics, these things can become much more livable and, and interesting. So I try to include in my uh, teaching and study of comics, a certain number of perspectives which see, I insist on the word see, the privilege of elite culture, namely uh, a strong formalist and historical point of view. For me, all these things are not incompatible at all. I would even say on the contrary. I have a very holistic point of view of, um, of what cultural studies should be. Jan, tell me, uh, uh, for our viewers, our listeners and viewers, what would be a, a kind of important moment in comics and kind of the, the materiality of the comic and... I'm com sure that the, the emergence of... Um, of comic books in the States, so in the early 30s, is really a turning point. Mm. Since it uh, produces a kind of clash or gap between mainstream comics, as they were existing in the, in the 20s with all kinds of adventure strips, which were targeting, let's say, a kind of general audience. General audience being, as we say in Europe, readers between seven and 77 years old. Uh, and that will completely change with the comic books as they were sold in newsstands, extremely cheap. And these comic books, I think for the very first time in the history of comics, were targeting only a very juvenile audience. And the tricky thing with comic books is that, that they could be bought and read by young readers let's say, without parental guidance, since newspapers were bought by their parents mm. or by their, their relatives. So there was a kind of social control that was still being exerted. And that is something that will drop with the comic books, where one notices that, let's say, that there's not only an, or no longer just an audience participation, but a really a kind of uh, becoming independent of a youth audience, uh, which starts reading without any parental or educational control and guidance. And the big, let's say, um, the big debates in the 50s, the Frederick Wirth and the seduction of the innocent, uh, etc., are, I think, a direct consequence of that kind of gap between, let's call it mainstream comics for a general audience, and then, the comic books targeting an, a juvenile audience and a strictly juvenile audience. Since after all, what is being shown and told in these comic books is certainly less horrible than what is happening, for instance, in picture books, which can be very horrible as well. Many fairy tales are absolutely horrible, but fairy tales and picture books are always read by the parents or by relatives to younger children. Mm 
So there's the physical presence and hence the physical, let's say the, the direct control of what the children are reading and thinking, um, which we don't have in, in comic books. And that is, I think, a good example of the way in which, let's say, the, a publication format can impact not just what is being produced, but also the way in which it is being read and the, let's say, the meaning that a society gives to a certain, um, in this case, a certain genre. I and of course, mm -hmm. answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Jan. Of course, um, you know, the bande dessinée has that long history of being bound like a book and sold in bookstores. And so also in that sense, um, a very different material history, as you already kind of talked about in your own journey from child to teen to adult, where it wasn't comics was just a part of your childhood. Comics or bon dessiné has always been a part of your life. Um, yeah, not just of my life, but really I'm just, I'm, I'm very representative of, um, let's say, the average Belgian, if not uh, the average uh, European, at least right. in the Latin part of Europe. Right. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about some of your um, many, you have so much work that we could talk about, but this one I'm particularly invested in selfishly because it's the one that's launching my critical graphics series with Rutgers University Press. Um, but there is a very strong sense in your work of not just the materiality, but also the creator, the creator um, and the importance of the creator Right. Maybe you can share us a little bit of uh, your work here with uh, rebuilding story worlds. Yes. And once again, thank you very much for having accepted um, my book and your, your, your series. I would like to congratulate also the, the work done by Rutgers University Press. It was really a dream working with them. The book will get in print in a couple of weeks. And I'm really eagerly waiting for it. Um, the story building, um, sorry, rebuilding story worlds is an, a monograph on what is probably the most important European Baudissine series of the last 30 years. It's actually a series that started in uh, 1983 and which finished. The, the series is closed now and will not be uh, continued, which finished uh, two years ago. Um, it is a very, um, not a very strange or curious series, but I think a very representative one in, um, in the sense that it's a typical author series, but the author in question is an, a double author. Um, there is an, um, a visual artist, Francois Kuyten, who has a strong background in, in um, architecture. Um, his father was a famous Belgian architect. Um, and the scriptwriter, the storyteller, if you want, Benoit Peters, was an, um, um, he studied with uh, Roland Barthes in Paris in the 70s. So he's a typical, let's say, postmodern writer uh, in Europe. And the collaboration between these two, uh, these, these two authors has something very special in the sense that there is not just a collaboration between a storyteller and a visual artist, but they really collaborate on all possible aspects of, of the comic, the sense that the visual artist participates in the writing of the story and the storyteller, the script writer, also participates in issues such as the page layout, the shaping of the characters, visual transitions and so on and so forth. So it's really, let's say, an, a wonderful example of the essential hybridity and um, between inverted commas, the impurity of, uh, of the medium. But when I say impurity, it's of course a compliment, eh? since um, 
the script writing has clearly benefited from the input of the, the, the visual arts and vice versa. But anyway, that is something that makes the series very special. And personally, I don't know any other example where storyteller and um, visual artists have really merged their competences and their qualities. But moreover, I think that the series is also uh, very representative of what comics artists are doing in general. They have to invent a world from scratch, but that world is of course not a completely fictional world. It has a world, it is a world that relates to our real world. And while making, uh, while writing this book, which is a kind of, which builds a fictional world that is an, if you want, a kind of historical science fiction, to call it uh, that way, I've been thinking all the time of, um, of Palomar. Since I'm sure that the way in which the Hernandez brothers are building their Palomar as a kind of countercultural, uh, not in the, the historical sense of the word, but um, in the, the very technical sense of the word, kind of reinventing of a real world, a real universe in a fictional, reshaped in a fictional environment. I think that the way in which the Hernandez brothers are working is not unlike uh, what is going on in this series. Um, but the series is not only representative because they, the authors show how to invent the world, how to invent um, the a story world as a, a visual background, as a fictional reservoir to, um, to invent stories while relying on the, the, the physical, on the materiality of that, that universe. But they also show how it is possible to, um, to progressively introduce new characters, new storylines, and to see how there is a direct link and a very strong link between character and world. I've always had some problems with um, the way in which the, the concept of story world has been defined uh, in the sense that um, for me, story world is an, a challenge and the challenge consists in bringing together a story and a world. And I think that many approaches, many definitions of story world do not ask that type of question. They take the, let's say the spatial setting for granted or they take the story for granted and they see how a story is then simply positioned um, in relationship with a given background or vice versa. Here, the series really shows how authors struggle with inventing, shaping permanently, reinventing, transforming both a world and a set of characters and a set of, of storylines. And uh, one also sees how the story world, the, the, the world changes when the story changes and vice versa. I think that um, the series demonstrates that very well. Moreover, uh, the, the, the work by um, Skuyten and Peters, I pronounce Skuyten since it's, uh, nobody knows how to exactly pronounce uh, that strange uh, name um, in Dutch, since it's uh, a Dutch name, we pronounce Skuyten. Um, Actually, it means embarkments, ships, if you want. Um, the French say Schwitten. I don't know how you pronounce it in, in the US, but I will say Skuyten to keep it, it simple. Um, both Skuyten and painters have also a very, very interesting, or they establish a very interesting relationship with let's say, in, in a visual tradition or a genre 
that is often, um, let's say, not taken into account in the, the study of comics or the study of his, uh, the, the study of the history of comics, namely illustration. We often um, establish relationships between, um, for instance, comics and caricature, cartooning. Whereas the relationship with um, illustration is, I think, very important, as, is as important as the relationship with caricature. And in the case of um, the Obscure Cities, which, by the way, is the title of that famous series, um, the authors succeed as well uh, in reviving, reactualizing, reinventing, resha reshaping the history of, um, let's say, the illustration techniques of um, canonical Western literature from the Renaissance till, uh, till uh, recently. And then the last element, which I consider absolutely fabulous and, and fascinating, is that um, the obscure cities is something that is in between the one shot, which is typical for the graphic novel, and the series, which is typical for, typical for let's say, popular, uh, popular comics. Uh, obscure City, the Obscure Cities are a set of works which can be read perfectly independently. You don't need to read the whole series in order to, to, to grasp what is going on in the individual books, which, by the way, are more and more um, available to the American reader as well since the, their work is published with um, IDW, which is, I think, a great um, and important comics publisher in the States. So you can read these things independently. You can also read them as in a complete series, but it's not a traditional series in the sense that both the, um, the, the, the world, the story world, and the stories, are never, let's say, homogeneous. The, there are many contradictions um, and transformations of the story world from one volume to another. Uh, there is no, let's say, linear chronology from one volume to another. The characters move. Um, they do not always have the same position, the same function, the same status. They can even change, let's say, their, their psychology. A positive character between inverted commas in volume A can become a very naughty and nasty one in volume B, etc., etc. So the idea of the homogeneity of, an, uh, of the series, which is a kind of dogma and a priori in many other series, is here dramatically challenged. And that I think is something that uh, makes the series absolutely um, singular and exceptional as well. Thank you for that, Jan. And it's so generative, uh, you know, your concept formulation of story world as story and world and the work that is required to kind of pull these together is by creators. Um, yeah, I think that's so, so generative. Um, You've also worked on literary adaptations or recreations, as I call them, in comics and graphic novels. What are some um, surprises, some areas that you might want to direct us to to think about? You know, there's so much, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is out there kind of bombarding us. But yeah, tell us, um, share with us, Jan, some, some insights. Yes. Um... Actually, that um, the, the, the text I wrote for um, your uh, excellent handbook helped me to actually to completely rethink my way of uh, tackling uh, this issue. The sense that, um, like many other scholars, I have long time believed that um, a good adaptation needed to be what is called a creative adaptation namely um, an adaptation uh, 
or a recreation that breaks um, or that, let's say, that does not respect the, um, the so-called fidelity rule. Fidelity rule was in, uh, in the 40s and the 50s, was a kind of, well, um, imperative. Good adaptations needed to be faithful to the original. The original was considered by definition superior to any kind of adaptation and recreation. There has been a strong reaction against that um, stereotypical view um, on adaptations since uh, the 1970s. And um, since the 1970s, a good adaptation is supposed to be, let's say, supposed to take some liberties in comparison with, uh, with the original. And that has produced wonderful uh, results. But I think that it is now time to restart thinking on, let's say, the possibilities of um, making faithful adaptations. And faithful adaptations, of course, not in the narrow or shallow sense of the word, but faithful adaptations are actually something that is extremely difficult to realize. It's much easier to take some liberties with your original, um, to, which is for me in many cases, a way of avoiding certain difficulties uh, involved by um, an adaptation assignment or an adaptation duty. So my, uh, let's say, intermediary reflection on adaptation, literary adaptations as defended in the handbook has been for me a springboard to, let's say, to a more radical uh, position which I'm uh, taking today. And that more radical um, uh, position would come down to, let's say, a new defense of fidelity. Not in the mechanical uh, word of trying to make a kind of, or to find a kind of one-to-one -one relationship between an, um, a source and a target, but an attempt as in fidelity for me, or a fidelity policy for me, um, would come down to, uh, to an attempt to, um, reinvent in a completely different medium, um, let's say, what makes the, the force, the power, the strength of the original. And um, let me give you a very simple uh, example of it. Um, when you make an, a comic adaptation, um, you are, of course, forced to, well, to um, to do something with dialogues. And in the case of dialogues, there are not just, let's say, the, the, there's not only the difficulty of transposing a written text into a different style, since you cannot, in a comics or in a filmic adaptation, ask your characters to speak like in a novel. That would be totally ridiculous. So a faithful adaptation is forced to, re to do an important uh, work of rewriting. But there's also, let's say, the, you have the obligation to put a face on what is being said in, in a novel. And that is extremely difficult as well. You can read a novel without having a precise idea of how you have to imagine um, the face, the body, um, the, um, let's say the embodiment of, embodiment of a certain speech. This is something you cannot skip, you cannot uh, avoid when making um, a comics or a, a graphic novel adaptation. And I'm convinced that there are faithful ways of doing so. And it's very easy when you compare let's say, different adaptations of the same work, you immediately see or you feel that there are adaptations that stick better to, let's say, to the spirit of the original uh, than, um, uh, than other ones. And I'm rather tempted to believe that um, since faithful adaptations are more difficult to do than non-faithful adaptations, 
that we should go today once again into the direction of, um, of faithful adaptation, faithful adaptations. The same applies to very simple things like um, when you read, for instance, in a novel, you read um, part of a dialogue, and then um, the, the author can add certain small remarks like, um, he said, or he said laughingly, or he said smilingly, and things like that. And the visual transposition of laughingly, wryly, smilingly, um, and so on and so forth. So the visual transpositions of these adverbs, I'm absolutely fascinated by it, by, by that kind of difficulties. And this is something I'm currently um, elaborating in a book that, um, well, let's hope will be published in French at the end of the year. But now with the COVID-19 century, so many publications have been or will be postponed. But it's a book in which I really try to, let's say, to uh, address from as many perspectives as possible all the difficulties involved by a faithful adaptation. Jan, what's a good example for our viewers, our listeners, um, of a say a good a, faith, a faithful according to your concept adaptation today in contemporary culture? Well. Um, the problem is that, of course, most of my, uh, let's say, um, examples are French examples, so they may not be well known to, um, let's say, to the people who are now listening and, and watching us. But uh, a good example of an, an, according to me, a quite faithful um, adaptation is the cinema, the movie version of Ghost, um, Ghost World. By Daniel Klaus. Okay. I'm a big fan of um, uh, Daniel Klaus, and I was quite happy um, discovering the movie adaptation uh, by Zwigoff, if I pronounce correctly. Yeah. Terry Zwigoff from early 20th century. For me, that is really a good example of, um, let's say, a both creative and faithful um, transposition of an initial uh, work, the initial work being itself already, let's say a creative reinterpretation in comics form of, according to the Klaus specialists, of a catcher in the rye. Uh, it's considered okay. that ghost world is a kind of reinterpretation of um, the catcher in the rye. Yeah, that's One, a great I, example. I think that, um, Let's say if you take these three works uh, together, so the catcher and the rind, then it's complete transposition, creative, unfaithful, but at the same time, very faithful transposition to the world of the, uni the comics universe, or graphic novel, novel universe, in Daniel Klaus um, serialized and then later on um, published in book format um, work which has then been transposed to cinema by Zwickoff. I think there you have an excellent example of a faithful um, but creative um, um, adaptation chain. Mm. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Jan, for that. Um, so teaching, uh, you are, I know, a beloved teacher there. I have get to see, I have the sort of great fortune of meeting some of your graduate students that you're shaping. Um, how, what are, what is the Jan trademark? You know, how do you, what's a, what's a kind of a, a method of teaching comics for you at the university level there at the university? That's a very difficult question since um, you only see my face, but actually <laughs> when I'm teaching, I always try to bring as many books or other publications, since I'm using a lot of magazines as well, I try to bring as much uh, material as possible to the class. It is for me extremely important that the students can really touch, feel and smell the real thing. 
I already mentioned a couple of minutes ago my, let's say, my interest in, in book history. And uh, for me, it is extremely important that the students can see that comics and graphic novels are not just something that, well, that you can read in any format or in any publication format whatsoever. Certainly not on screen. I don't have anything against reading comics on screen. I uh, want to, to put that uh, very clearly. But we all know that most comics authors and certainly graphic novelists are extremely reluctant to create for the screen. They still stick to ink and paper, even if they use the computer to produce and to print their works. But once again, the, the, the physical, the traditional materiality of, um, of these works is important. And then the students immediately become aware of two things. On the one hand, the extreme diversity of publication formats. Um, I showed them, let's say, uh, comics which are what we call in Europe small formats. And small formats are um, smaller than comic books. So really something that you can slip into your pocket. So more or less the size of a, a, a classic uh, pocketbook. I show them also, of course, 3D works like Building Stories by Chris Ware. So they become aware of the extreme diversity of, of comics, which then, let's say, become to a certain extent sculptures. It is very important for me that the students see that comics are something that is not, let's say, just a sheet of paper with words and images on it, but that these things circulate in the real world and circulate in very different formats. That you can collect them, that you can buy them, swap them, show them, do something with, um, uh, with them um, in any way whatsoever. That's one thing. And the other thing is that um, I want also the students to become aware of the extreme vulnerability of these objects since we all think that everything is available. That is, let's say, one of the big myths of our current digital culture. Everything is, let's say, available or accessible with just one click. That is, of course, completely false. When you really are looking for something, you will never find it. You need to put a certain effort to find it. And once you have it, you have to be extremely careful with it since many comics and graphic novels are printed on bad paper. Um, they are not, let's say, taken care of as we take care of, for instance, a, an expensive coffee table book or whatsoever. These things are meant to, are considered disposable objects to be consumed in the negative sense of the word namely consumed and then thrown away. I try to show the students how important it is to, let's say, to, to start collecting um, comics themselves and then to see how comics change over time and how comics do not always remain comics. There is a permanent overspill from popular and, and mainstream culture in general to the world of comics and vice versa. And I want to, let's say, to, to highlight, to, to, to make that, uh, let's say, circulation, that permanent migration from one medium, and a medium as a universe, also a social practice, from one medium to another, I want to make that visible and even um, tangible. And um, that is for me the, let's say the, one of the things that, that's a driving uh, force in my teaching of comics. Um, and that, um, let's say that motivation for me has also an impact on um, 
on all the rest of my teaching, mm. since I'm not just teaching comics or popular culture, I'm also teaching and with great pleasure more canonical uh, stuff. Mm. And there as well, it is extremely important that the students realize that what we consider canonical today might have been extremely popular before and vice versa. And the, the migration between, let's say, cultural levels, cultural fields, cultural groups is, is for me very crucial, not only in the field of popular culture, but also in the field of, once again, with many inverted commas, high culture or elite culture. I do, let's say, for me, the, I do not believe in, let's say, the, the, the elite and, and high culture should not be an ivory tower as well. Um, if I, I mentioned um, T.S. Eliot a couple of minutes ago, you know that there are graphic novel adaptations of T.S. Eliot, of the, uh, the Wasteland. It is extremely important to show both at the same time, to study both at the same time. If not, the students will never let's say, understand how T.S. Eliot himself in the Wasteland and other books, um, other collections of poetry was actually reusing, appropriating material that was often extremely popular. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a way of, let's say, blurring. If I like to teach comics, it is not because I like comics, because I think comics are crucial to understand contemporary culture, but also to, let's say, to allow to, to, um, um, to produce a new take on, on, on mainstream and so-called high or elite culture. Yeah, and that's that migration is really the, the, the key. Yeah, that uh, cross migration, the permeability of the boundaries that are sort of artificial, actually, right? Those those um, artificial boundaries. Um, you've just talked a little bit about this. Uh, what about film, Jan? I know that film is also very important to you, um, and also, you know, and it's different ways that it exists. Sometimes it's not on the screen that it exists. That's true. I'm. Um... I do not consider myself a film scholar. I've never been trained as a film scholar. Um, so um, I'm more, in, let's say, an amateur. Um, nevertheless, I have a strong interest in what, I'm, what I call film in print. Film in print is, let's say, actually something that I, I like to tackle from two different perspectives. On the one hand, I uh, like to, to show how diverse, how heterogeneous, how rich the different forms of cinema or film and print can be. And that there's the whole range from uh, novelizations to film novels and so on and so forth. I'm collecting that stuff as well. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, but that just one perspective. The other perspective is, let's say, more radical. I, um, I am convinced, it's a personal uh, conviction, personal belief, that many people um, only know film, not in general, but know certain films only through their print version. Um, and I'm thinking here more particularly of a book um, you must have read as well. It's certainly available. I'm now addressing um, the students and the audience. It has been translated in, um, uh, in English as well. It's a book by a French colleague, Pierre Bayard. And the title is, um, how to I'm paraphrasing the title, hmm? how to speak about books that you haven't read. And the author demonstrates that um, actually in 99% of the cases, uh, the books we are discussing, we are analyzing, that we haven't actually read these books. 
we only know summaries. We have read reviews. Um, we have heard people um, talking about these books. We have seen their movie adaptations uh, and so on and so forth. And the author does not want to convince us that we should be ashamed of that, but that is simply part of life and that we should take seriously the fact that reading books may, let's say, take place in other forms than just taking the book and reading it. And that these other forms of, let's say, um, accessing um, the, uh, the richness of, of uh, our literary and cultural heritage, that these other popular visual and other forms, that these other forms are as interesting, as worthwhile, as elite, traditional, close reading. Mm. And I try to in, uh, implement that in my teaching of, of cinema as well, since um, I invite students to, um, to analyze a movie via their own uh, novelization. I ask them to, um, to novelize not complete movies, but fragments, of course. I ask them also to, for instance, to, to draw the storyboard of, an, of the fragment of a novel, a chapter of a, a Kafka um, uh, novel, for instance, and then we compare it with the way in which well, Kafka have been, uh, has been adapted uh, um, uh, in, in, into movies uh, and so on and so forth. And that double perspective, so on the one hand, the different ways that can lead you to a given work, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, the question that is, let's say, raised, or the difficulty that is raised when you don't have access to uh, a book, unless you read the, or unless you have the movie adaptation of it, or vice versa the impossibility of watching a movie while you only have the novelized version of it. This is something that I, let's say, um, which is for me the, actually the center of my teaching of, um, um, of the different media that I'm, I'm teaching. I always try to, let's say, to, to break up the, these medium boundaries since I really believe that um, the way in which the audience, the public, readers, viewers, you and me, are accessing um, our cultural heritage is a multi-medium, cross-platform um, um, approach. We do not simply read books by reading books. No, we read books also. We also read books through, for instance, movies and vice versa. And so that's, uh, let's say, the, 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 the alpha and omega of what I'm doing when, um, when teaching uh, graphic novels, cinema, but also poetry. Wonderful. Um, speaking of which, you are also a poet and an award-winning poet, Jan. Tell me, so you well there are many ways that you create you you create through your teaching but you also create through words um how how does this operate in your life what you know how is poetry how is the sort of act of creating and putting something in the world for you um, well the answer is actually very simple um I'm, I've always been a, a very, let's say, um, strong poetry reader. I've been reading poetry not since my childhood, of course. That would be, be silly to, to say so. But I'm, I've started uh, reading poetry since I was, let's say, 15, 16. So it's simply part of my life. Um, but I'm not, let's say, reading graphic novels having a graphic novel in my left hand and a collection of poetry in my right hand. You know, here as well, I try to blur the boundaries 
as much as possible. And I'm doing so by, um, in a very simple way, I'm only writing on uh, topics, on subjects, on issues, on problems that I'm uh, encountering in other elements, other aspects, at other moments of, um, of my professional and, and private life, which means that, for instance, I, I've written a collection of poetry uh, on the history of comics. I have described in poetic form, in poetic format, my, let's call it my ideal library, uh, my ideal comics library, starting from um, the early 19th century Swiss inventor of modern comics, Rodolphe Tupfer, till today, the Chris Ware, um, Charles Burns, um, and so on and so forth. There's even some, some room for um, what we call today abstract comics. And um, in some 50, 60, uh, 60 uh, poems, I've tried to reconstruct that history, try in uh, each case to find a specific format um, that matches the specific style of the author, the artist, the work that I'm describing. It's a very traditional genre, uh, one could say. It's um, with a technical term, it's called ekphrastic poetry. Uh, but um, the, the, the special, let's say, um, technique I've used is to, to change style for each, um, each uh, different artist and, and period. And I like to, to change uh, styles, just like I like to, to change um, topics and media. But I'm not just writing on, on, um, on, on comics. I've written a lot on cinema as well. I've been doing novelizations in poetic form. Um, I've been doing it with um, uh, a famous new wave film by Godard, um, My Life to Live, Vivre sa vie in French. And I'm currently um, finishing well, actually, it's finished, but not yet um, in print. I made a bilingual um, adaptation in French and Spanish of a Spanish movie. Not just, uh, I collaborated with um, a colleague in Spain, and uh, we simultaneously wrote, well, I wrote the text in French, he wrote the text in Spanish. We did it simultaneously. I was, we were at the same time reacting one to, um, to another. Then we also rewrote each other once there was a, a draft version. And the film in question is um, El Espíritu de la Colmena. Uh, the name of the director is Victor Erice. It's a film uh, of um, 1973 film, which is often considered and I'm one of those two, um, who, who are believing that. It's often considered the best Spanish, I mean, Iberic, uh, not necessarily Spanish speaking, but best Spanish Iberic uh, film of, uh, of all times. It's an absolutely uh, fascinating uh, work of art. Stylistically speaking, very close to um, the work of the Iranian director, uh, Kiarostami. I don't know if he is known in the United States. Kiarostami, they are often, uh, let's say, presented as a kind of, let's say, spiritual tandem. Um, the director from Iran and uh, the director from, from Spain. And we completely, we did, we did a kind of, complete mashup of, of the story. And uh, we were also allowed by the director to make also a creative reuse of um, screenshots of the movie. So the, the, the novelization, the bilingual uh, novelization in poetic form we made, uh, 
is not just a retelling of the story, it's a retelling of actually four different stories, since there are four main protagonists in, in the story. And um, in our novelization, we, um, it's, it's more or less like As I Lay Die, uh, the, the Faulkner novel, where you have a kind of mix of different perspectives on the same topic. There we have, in, in the case of our novelization, we have four perspectives on the same um, event or non-event in four different styles. And the images that we were allowed to borrow to take from the movie do not follow at all the, the sequential structure of the original, but present a kind of visual reinvention, reshaping, reimagination of the, in this case, the story world, so the, the universe in which the, the story is taking place. I hope that we'll, I will have the possibility to send you a copy, well, as soon as possible. Um, and I hope that that book will be read in the States as well, since let's say half of the text is in Spanish. Yeah, I hope so. Let's, uh, I look forward to that, Jan. Um, in Europe, you know, I, I, when I speak with your colleagues there working in the space of comics, and I ask them, you know, what's going on, and then they say manga is kind of, you know, on all of the young people's minds out there. But where do you see the vitality in, say, European comics today? You are absolutely right in, in mentioning the, the manga. Um, um, I would call it an issue, since there is a complete gap, at least here in, in let's say, the Franco-Belgian tradition between manga readers and non-manga readers. Manga readers never read comics, nor vice versa. It's really two different, uh, different universes, different worlds. But I personally believe that um, the, the, the European comics and graphic novel sphere is extremely um, driving and then vital. And for me, the vitality is, I would say, twofold. On the one hand, it is crucial to underline that there is a strong institutional backing, the sense that um, we have excellent festivals and high quality festivals. You see here Angoulême, but there are dozens and dozens. Well, Angoulême is, of course, the biggest. Um, but every country has three or four Angoulême's. Smaller ones, of course, but it's really all over the place. More and more uh, comics are present also in, in museums. Uh, they are part of let's say, mainstream cultural life and strongly backed by um, public institutions. In, uh, in the Belgian context, for instance, there is special funding for comics artists. Um, and um, there are on an, you know that Belgium is a very small country. There are between, let's say, 20 to 25 um, comics, uh, comic artists who receive every year a quite an important grant to produce high quality comics and, and graphic novels. So that institutional backing is really important. But that's one thing. The other thing is that I think that um, and I'm very happy to, to see that evolution. Comics are let's say, no longer just comics. Or graphic novels are no longer just comics. There is a kind of generalized merger that is going on, not just via uh, movie adaptations. That would be, let's say, the, the US um, uh, equivalent of that. Our film business is not, let's say, economically speaking, powerful enough to to finance, to fund that kind of, to produce that kind of um, 
often very expensive adaptations. But what is going on is that comics are becoming 3D objects. More and more comics artists are really moving towards uh, something like installation art. There is a kind of merger between comics and installation art, which opens, of course, the doors of galleries, museums, and so on and so forth. And as also, and I think this is really typical uh, for Europe, there is also um, a kind of merger between the comics or graphic novels and what we call photo novels. It's what you call in the US fumetti. Um, and um, so photo novels are something that resembles or that something that re vaguely resembles comics. It's comics with pictures, if you want. But the traditional gap between photo novels or fumetti and comics and graphic novels, that gap, that boundary is increasingly vanishing. And there is, um, that has to do with um, the, the current importance of graphic journalism. Graphic journalism in comics and in photo novel has become a very big thing in Europe today. And as a result of that importance, there has been a merger of both media, if you want, um, the best known traditional example is, of course, the, um, the photographer uh, by Lefebvre and Guibert that has been translated in, um, in, in the US as well. But um, that is still, let's say, a very classic merger of, let's say, comics, comics panels and photo novel panels within the same page, within the same album the same book we have today more let's say radical mergers and and hybridizations of these two types and and this is a very recent phenomenon um, a couple of months ago um, a, a photo novel journalist so someone doing non-fiction in photo novels has received a big comics prize which means that, let's say, the, also in the, let's say, conceptually speaking, the distinction between comics, which have become, which were and are now really mainstream in European culture, and photo novel, which continue to be a very despised medium, there as well one notices that the, 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 that kind of, of gap distinction boundary is, is vanishing. And I think it's a very encouraging um, evolution and phenomenon. Certainly, if one manages to, to link it with that um, tendency toward installation art and 3D art in comics format. I think the vitality is also there. Yeah. Next, of course, as I said, the, uh, the strong uh, public and institutional uh, backing, mm. and of course also the huge production. Uh, there are still uh, thousands and thousands and thousands new comics and graphic novels that are produced every year. I wish we had that same infrastructure for our creators in the U.S., where we had um, even a minimum of institutional backing. Um, but I guess we could say that kind of of the arts in general, um, right? Creators of literature, creators of art. I think that, you know, governments um, should be, you know, subventing um, all of the arts, right? Um, Jan, um, gosh, this has been really amazing for me and I know it will be for our viewers, listeners, uh, you know, university professor, scholar, comics creator, photo novel, novelizer, polymath, Jan Batens. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for all the questions and the time and uh, thanks also to all those who are listening and watching us.